Uh, can each of you tell us a little bit more about your backgrounds and in particular share your journey from medicine into biotech and what you're most proud of uh, that you've done throughout your career thus far? In, in no particular order, but maybe actually we could start since since you're unmuted uh, with, with Dr. Bradner and Jay. Oh boy, okay, I'll be brief. Um, I like to think that my career is just getting warmed up. Uh, I'm a hematologist by training and a stem cell transplant physician. And um, I guess, you know, during postgraduate training as a physician was disappointed in how creative the medicines were that we had available, that we were enrolling patients on study. They weren't all Gleevec, you know? And so I went back and retrained as a, a chemical biologist in an organic chemistry environment and then started a lab um, studying uh, the way genes are turned on through a protein called BRD4. And um, I think doing chemistry and chemical biology research in translational model systems opened my eyes to the possibility of spending a, a big part of my career making medicines. And so through some biotech experiences that spun out of our lab and ultimately this chance to um, work in R&D uh, at the Swiss pharmaceutical giant Novartis um, was really very gratifying. Um, the second part of your question about things I'm proud of, um, I think it's good to be proud, it's bad to be prideful. Um, uh, it was very special to me when the um, the trainees from my academic lab, you know, went on to um, themselves lead biotech companies and become professors um, at great institutions, MGH, Vienna, um, and the vibe that they all have and the close friendships that they um, that they still retain. Um, very proud of that community and the community at Nibber, the, our leadership team, and the science there scientifically. Um, it was very special to translate some of the work from our academic lab on bromo domain inhibition to see the chemistry of protein degradation really come to life uh, and to get to work on molecular glues and hit some of the toughest targets in cancer. But um, as Levi Garraway once said, in, in our line of work, you always hope to have more tomorrows than yesterdays. And I'm very much of that, of that mindset. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, maybe Akshay will go to you next. Um... So I'm a UK trained, Indian born, but UK trained physician scientist. Um, and I had a passion for immunology as an undergraduate and that led to a career in internal medicine and rheumatology. I also did a PhD in molecular immunology. And after 10 years of doing all that as, as clinical and postgraduate training, um, came out to the States on a traveling fellowship. And I was very lucky to be at uh, New York Hospital, Cornell New York Hospital in the Rheumatology Immunology Division at a very interesting time in the evolution of our field. Um, and I'm sure Jay and Shanaz can relate to it um, between 95 and 98. And, you know, you really saw a unique transition from, you know, molecular biology and molecular genetics really impacting the understanding of disease. And, um, you know, when I been working as a rheumatologist like Jay, I was very frustrated. We used to use things like elemental gold to treat rheumatoid arthritis patients. We didn't understand the disease, we didn't understand the treatment we were using, but it kind of worked from time to time. And that was very dissatisfying. And so, you know, having the good fortune to have uh, a fundamental training in science and be able to ask those questions then led to a career in industry quite by happenstance, actually, as to how that happened. I was ready to go back to the UK to join an academic career there, but I joined Biden in late 98, had seven wonderful years there and, and learned the kind of nuts and bolts of how to uh, develop medicines. I was fortunate enough to be on a program that we got a drug approved uh, and uh, an immuno immunobiologic for psoriasis. And I also started learning about the other aspects of uh, life in industry. And it's interesting that, um, um, you know, academia, which I'd largely been in up until 98, uh, teaches you a lot about being a physician and excelling in, in, in medicine. Um, it doesn't teach you much about being a leader or a manager or a team member. And, and so I learned a lot about that in my life at Biogen in those days and continue to to this day. And um, 
you know, ultimately that led to Al Nilam at the end of 2005, where I had the good fortune of being with just a remarkable team. And uh, a theme I'll come back to later is the what and the how, you know, these are the two axes we function on. Um, and we kind of measure ourselves on in many companies in, in biopharma. And um, the what at Al Nilam has been very gratifying as we've helped create a new class of medicine. So we're obviously very proud of that. But, you know, as I kind of get older, um, I'm, I'm just struck by how much is determined by the how rather than the what. And, you know, I, I think that we could do so much better in industry if we continue to perfect our teamwork and leadership and management styles. And, and, you know, if our productivity improved from one out of 10 drugs that are put in the clinic being approved to, you know, two out of 10, that would be amazing. You know, we'd double the product. And I often see opportunities for us to work better together. And so that's been a, a bit of a late learning in my life. You know, when I was in academia in medicine, uh, I was slow to learn all those things, but the how journey has been very interesting and important. And ultimately, the thing personally I'm most proud of, because like uh, Jay, we now have um, six chief medical officers and two CEOs who have gone through the R&D group at Alton Island that uh, we work together and, and I saw them blossom and it's wonderful to see them carrying on the legacy of Alton Island and other places and trying to create medicine. So that's been my journey. That's amazing. And the, the theme of, of skills required in industry is something that we'll get back to uh, later. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Shanaz, if you could tell us a little bit about, about your journey. Certainly. So I'm a South African-born physician. I also trained in South Africa in the Commonwealth model, which I'm sure Akshay is very familiar with. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially was the equivalent of a general medicine specialist and then had the good fortune to get a Rhodes Scholarship and was interested in public health. So did development economics, followed by business school at Oxford, which then led to a completely non-linear journey. And I think the theme of my learnings have been the path, whether it's linear or non-linear, can still get you to where you want to be ultimately, because it's very much about the journey as well as um, the end goal. And there is no end goal in this business because we're all trying to make a difference to patients every day in whatever form that takes in whatever therapeutic area and category. But um, my transition, I had a pass through in investment banking, which was really funny because I had no idea what that was, um, because I needed an H-1B visa. So sometimes you have to be pragmatic in life, and that was one of those opportunities. And it brought me to the U.S., and it allowed me to discover biotech, which became my true passion. I joined Gilead in the early days when they were an HIV company and um, a billion-dollar market cap, developing the first once-a-day, one 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 pill once a day treatment regimen for HIV, which completely transformed uh, HIV from being a death sentence to being a chronic disease. Um, I was able to double down on that by um, thinking about creative models to sign deals with Indian generic companies that then enabled us to make those HIV drugs available in the developing world. And I think it'll be my enduring legacy till I die, the fact that those deals led to 20 million patients in the developing world having access to one pill once a day regimens, which were um, you know, the key innovation at Gilead that enabled people to live productive and constructive lives. And so I think um, you know, the, the, the journey for me has been very much about impact at every stage of the journey. After Gilead, um, where I was pre predominantly, by the way, working on deals, how to diversify the company out of HIV into new therapeutic franchises, you know, going to ASCO in the early days and doing the evaluation on which companies to buy. And we bought five of them on my watch, which led to the establishment of oncology and immunology franchises, which are a big part of Gilead's identity today. But that work started early back in the 90s. Uh, I went to Genentech after that to do drug development. So again, completely non-linear path. I had never done that in that capacity. Spent six years, in fact, uh, running an early development portfolio. And, um, you know, similar to what Akshay said, it was very much about teams and teams develop drugs, not individuals. That's what Art Levinson, the legendary CEO of Genentech, always used to say. So don't even pretend that we can do this on our own. And the project team leadership model at Genentech, I think, was best in class. And it really did show how to create these super functioning matrix-led teams that were cross-functional in nature. And of course, huge, huge franchises, huge, huge leadership in oncology and, and other. And the how is as important as the what, very much so. 
And so then I could make that transition to smaller companies. And so I think, you know, this is really fundamentally about um, developing skills that are situational context dependent, continuing to build on those skills and leveraging those skills so that you can do jobs that allow you to have even greater impact with every successive role. And it's it's really not about titles or anything like that. It's really more about fundamentally, how can I enhance the toolkit that I have so that I can continue to grow as a leader and continue to motivate and inspire others to be the best version of themselves to do what we all want to do, which is have the greatest possible impact we can to patients. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And I'm hearing this theme throughout of, um, you know, leadership and teamwork and um, how important those skills are to develop, whether you're in medicine or industry. Um, I think I'll circle back to you, Shanaz, for this first question um, about how you use your medical background in your day-to-day -day work in, in biotech. And I know you've had many different types of roles throughout industry, so um, potentially today, but if there are other, um, other roles that you think would be interesting to share, you know, our goal really is to get physicians um, from medical students to uh, attendings to understand how their skills can be transferable. So interested to yeah. hear you have used of course. Those. Well, I mean, I use everything I've learned in medicine every day. And it's maybe a slight tweak on just purely being a clinician, but I think most of us are physician scientists, which means that we interrogate basic science and we look for the avenue, avenues to translate basic science to translational science and then ultimately to clinical impact. So I think it's really about developing the continuum of read through from basic science to the clinic that matters. Um, as a physician, you can have empathy for really understanding patient's plight and interacting with um, key opinion leaders in a very meaningful way and understanding, you know, trial the product profiles and how it might actually be used in the real world. Um, as a physician scientist, you can really look for the opportunities to seek out experiments that will lead you to better predictive value before you get to the clinic and then to enhance the probability of technical success when you get there. And so you learn to think that way. I think if you haven't done a PhD, which I haven't, I have done too many degrees, which, <laughs> which is a problem. But, you know, I would just say for the, my, my experience as a physician has been absolutely fundamental um, in, in enabling me to how, to how to have empathy for patients, see the end goal, understand how target, target product profiles uh, translate to impact and then developing a scientist mindset about uh, drug development. Got it. Uh, thanks for that, Shanaz. I guess on the, the flip side of that coin to, to Akshay, there are a lot of skills that uh, we as clinic, clinical trainees or physicians may develop through the course of our, our work. Um, but then there are a lot of skills and, and things you need to be able to do that you may not get a chance to learn in medicine that you'll need to develop to succeed in industry. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what skills you found you really needed to work on in, in progressing in your career in, in biotech outside of the context of, of clinical medicine. Yeah, I, you know, just to go back to that what, how framework or the two axes I, I mentioned, I think on the what side, that's all the technical stuff and, and Shana's already alluded to a lot of it. I think that comes, if you've had good training and you've applied yourself, a lot of that comes naturally as, as people like us transition to industry. I think most of the new skills and new learnings, proportionately speaking, come from the how side. And um, in at least, I, I train in Britain in terms of my medical training, training both undergraduate and postgraduate, and working for 10 years as a junior doctor and a senior doctor, it's kind of a command and control model. and um, that just doesn't work in industry and it shouldn't work because what we do is complex and it requires input from many different colleagues to get to the right answer for the problems in front of us at any given point in time. So it's an intense kind of teamwork where you have to learn to listen, you have to learn to solicit, you have to learn to give opinion at the right time, you have to learn to lean in and be forceful at the right time, you have to learn when to back off and you know, these are all the gives and takes of, um, of working in a team and of course there are many others. And then, you know, mentorship um, and, um, you know, learning to take risks. Uh, sometimes the science points you in a direction and you want more data, but you have to make a decision. And, and so these, these are all kinds of new things uh, to me 
Um, not completely new because you count some of them in medicine, but, but just the extent to which they impact how you function and how you function effectively. Um, and, and then, you know, a kind of a blend of the what and the how is I think the industry also offers a wonderful opportunity for physicians to stretch into new areas. And so, um, you know, I've done business development where I sidle up to colleagues who are looking at uh, molecules or programs in other companies and saying, oh, would this be a fit for our pipeline? You know, should we collaborate with them? And th those are complex sort of scientific, medical and business discussions. And, you know, it's been a wonderful opportunity to learn new skills. Um, as well as drug safety, for example. And sometimes, you know, there's an adverse event in a patient and you're certainly using medical skills, but there are all sorts of other skills that come into play there as well, or statistical, you know, skills. So there are lots of opportunities to develop these other, other skills, many of them on the how, but also some new technical skills. And then fundamentally, of course, on the day-to-day, -day, most of the time it's leveraging your skills as a, as a physician with scientific skills and insights and helping on the what, you know, in the teams you work in. Shanaz and Jay, do you have anything to add on that point around skills that you should kind of learn as you transition to industry? You know, um, I, I, everything actually just said, I really resonates with me. There were so many things that translated um, an interdisciplinary approach to science, science at the intersections, um, being an expert in something, but being linguistically, conceptually, experimentally familiar with a greater breadth. Mm -hmm. um, the leadership teams in industry tend to be like fielding an infield. There's expertise around the table, but at the table, you're really there to take on the whole problem. Mm -hmm. I found that being a stem cell transplant doctor and the way we practice in a very consultative way to just get the expert to the bedside when the patient is ill, translated really well to just finding the right expert in our organization or beyond to tackle a really challenging problem, to never get over your skis um, or to pretend to know something that you don't. Um, and the community of scientists, venture capitalists, um, that made things like business development quite easy. But there were definitely some new skills um, that were more on the job training because I, I didn't have an MBA or have the privilege of working in a investment bank. I just, a nerd in a lab. Um, I think the business speak, the acronyms and the concepts were all very new. The good news, it's all addition and subtraction. It's not complex math, but the bad news is it's all enshrouded just like medicine is in impenetrable acronyms. I can remember my second executive committee meeting where our CEO, Joe Jimenez pulls me aside at a break and he says, Jay, you can't do email during this meeting. I know that it's a finance meeting, but you know, you got to not do email. And I turned my computer around. I'm like, Joe, I'm on Investopedia looking up what EBITDA stands for. <laughs> and um, after 76 meetings, you get the hang of it. Um, leadership. Leadership in academia, we don't talk much about it, but it's really important in industry. In industry, people really want to know what the priorities are. They want to map to them. They want to contribute to them. And they know that it's the ultimate team sport. And so having a leadership framework, which I didn't, uh, let alone leadership experience, um, was a, a heavy download. And then the last thing I'll say is, is P&L management. My lab had 30 people and an annual budget of $3 million, never had 5,600 people in an annual budget of $3 billion. And those extra zeros were a very weighty responsibility. It felt the, and I think that like learning anything new, you know, you try to triangulate from multiple sources, the people who are expert around you, but not to belabor or beleaguer them. Uh, you look to textbooks and a lot of online content and asking the right question. And like we do in medicine, see one, do one, teach one. Um, but it was a very heavy, um, but fun download. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have too much to add, honestly. I think... Um, I think, you know, a lot of the stuff you just learn by doing <laughs> and, you know, if you've got a, a good head on your shoulders and, you know, you have a lens through which to um, learn things, you know, and if that's a clinical lens, that's fantastic. If that's a that's a basic science lens, also fantastic. I mean, the interesting thing about this is uh, you, no matter what you come into it with, uh, in industry, you it is it is for the most part an enabling environment that 
allows you, you know, because in a startup, there just aren't enough people to go around. So everybody has to wear multiple hats and do lots of things. Otherwise, the jobs don't get done and things don't succeed and you don't move the needle and you don't live to fight another day. You know, in larger companies, well, there are lots of development opportunities in the functional larger companies where you can, as part of your learning and development plan, choose to do a rotation or learn something new or be on a project or staffed. So I think I think it's um, maybe a little bit of a mindset that you have to adapt. And, you know, it's not like practicing medicine, like the patient isn't going to die if in, in industry if, you know, you, you make a less than optimal decision. You live with the consequences for sure, but it's sort of a different table stakes as it relates to um, taking risk. So I think you can afford to take risk and learn a lot and, be better at what you do, you know? Absolutely. I'm hearing a lot about, you know, what you're saying about taking risk, learning on the job, which I think are things that we in medicine um, are, are doing, as Jay was saying, learn one, uh, see one, do one, teach one. Um, but you're able to do that in hopefully a less, a, a little bit more of a, a high stakes environment um, in industry. And we, I think we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, this was a question that was submitted um, beforehand from one of our attendees. Um, and perhaps, Jay, I'll direct this towards you. Um, simply put, is there room to practice part-time and work in industry? How has kind of your desire to see patients and have that direct impact change over your career? Hmm. Well, short answer is yes. <laughs> in many roles, uh, you can continue to practice medicine in a limited capacity and work even at a very high leadership level in industry. I recruited Alice Shaw to lead clinical oncology um, early development at Novartis. And she is a leading thoracic lung cancer physician at MGH and um, has been able to keep her practice. Some institutions like the Dana-Farber have really clamped down and don't allow um, uh, physician scientists who've transitioned to a private research environment to continue their practice. I think that's a shame uh, because though conflicts can arise, they just frequently don't. They can be managed. And this is a chance for the academic environment to gain access to new concepts, connections, ways of thinking. Um, but, but many physicians are able to. Um, during COVID, some of us re-enlisted as emergency physicians. I'm glad that at the Brigham, it never got so bad that they needed a Novartis pharmaceutical executive in the ICU, um, but there are ways to do it. I would say this though, um, really think twice about it um, because um, sometimes by hyperfractionating um, the dominant area of focus in your life, a chapter on science, a chapter on private science, a chapter on clinical practice um, is really best spent sort of all in. And I had it in my contract that I could continue to do bone marrow transplantation, but it's just not realistic for executives with fiduciary responsibilities in Novartis to read out serious adverse events on an Eli Lilly drug at the bedside of a patient on the transplant wards. Um, I just found that unmanageable. And so on the heels of working at Novartis, I'm back in the clinic uh, um, again, and um, I think by keeping, you know, your license active, I had to retake boards, but it was fun. It's kind of like listening to old records um, and, you know, getting a sense of how far a field has advanced. Um, it's possible, um, but I would only do it if it's so core to your sense of identity and purpose that you really would feel too far afield um, um, from your North Star. Thanks for that. Uh, you actually really have me thinking about my own uh, sort of future journey with with those kind of considerations in mind. Um, Shanaz and Akshay, any uh, other thoughts there? Yeah, I, I would add that you know that there's particularly for for doctors early in their career who are transitioning. You know, Jay was very senior when he transitioned to industry, um, but you know, I I did a clinic a week at MGH in rheumatology for the first few years, and then as Jay was implying, it kind of became unmanageable um, in part because my Bajan job was so all-consuming and occupying and I wanted to devote the time to that. But there's a kind of um, holding on to the mothership. You know, most people have grown up in academia before they transition to industry. 
and and they don't want to completely let go. And and generally, when I've recruited MDs, if they want to do that, um, notwithstanding Jay's advice, I, I I encourage them to do it. It's fine, you know. On average, about one out of 20, one out of 10 MDs who come into industry don't enjoy it and want to go back quite rapidly. Um, so that can be helpful if they've, if they've maintained that contact. And, and for many of them, in all honesty, it's also they want to um, maintain a sense of self because that was their original identity. And, and that's fine. And, and they like the patient contact. They, they, you know, they've often had, had a practice and they don't want to abandon their patients. Um, but, but in the long run, what happens is that I would say eight, nine out of 10 MDs transition well, they settle down and eventually they kind of tend to let go of that one clinic a week or a day a week or whatever they were doing, um, and then get fully occupied with their industry roles. Um, and, um, you know, I agree with Jay that if you're going to do something, you've got to be kind of all in. And most of us have been fortunate that the kinds of opportunities industries afforded us, we, it, we're gladly all in because it is intellectually and otherwise very satisfying and engaging uh, to do the work that we've, we've had the privilege to do. Absolutely. Thanks for that. I think we'll shift gears a little bit and ask a question to Shanaz actually, and in, in thinking about uh, sort of the future of biotech and how physicians may play a role at Recode. We know you're doing a lot of very exciting work in, in mRNA delivery and, and targeted delivery to the lungs and to other organs. Um, and just generally speaking, we're curious to know what headwinds in the industry are most exciting to you currently and what tailwinds worry you most. And if there are any trends that you notice in industry with, with regards to those two things related to vision, talent, and, and careers. Yeah, um, well, I mean, we're, we're very fortunate to build on, you know, the learnings and the legacy from all Nylum and everything that Akshay and the team have done for genetic medicine and to be on the cusp of the next wave and doing extra hepatic delivery of both gene editors and mRNA is really an exciting place to be. And I'm sure that Akshay will agree that the future is bright. And as we think about precision genetic medicine, maybe this is the decade in which that becomes uh, so much more of a reality, thanks to their pioneering efforts. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, from a small company perspective, the, the, the headwinds in the macro environment certainly are quite challenging from the point of view of just financing and, you know, access to capital and the public markets being shut. And, um, you know, I think a risk off mentality from the investors, you know, if you're a later stage company and, and those kinds of things, which are very, very difficult. They aren't technical challenges per se, but they are macro headwinds that affect everyone in some way, shape or form. And so, um, you know, there's, there's just a little bit of that. Um, I mean, the tailwinds are the advances we've seen in, in medicine, you know, in precision medicine, um, you know, more recently in AI and computational methods and bioinformatics. And, you know, I serve on the board of 10X Genomics, which is a global leader in single cell gene sequencing and multi-omics and transcriptomics and, you know, multiplexing and that kind of thing. And so I think we understand uh, biology at a resolution that was unprecedented. We have the tools now, in, you know, with gene editing and next generation gene editors to do things that weren't possible before. So all of that is extremely helpful. And I think, you know, for anyone contemplating making a change, um, it, it's really about, you know, how to navigate progress in the context of uncertainty, because these, these headwinds and, you know, all of, all of that's just uncertainty that you have to deal with on top of the technical uncertainty that goes with, you know, being a, a research or discovery platform company and then moving into the clinic and, you know, all the usual stuff we have to deal with. So that's extra. But then I think on the flip side, what's exciting about this is if you have a growth mindset and you're willing to embrace the possibility, which which are, I think, unprecedented in terms of, you know, some of the tools we have at our disposal, then it could be a very, very exciting place to be. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely uh, exciting to hear about precision medicine and, and some of the work you're doing. In addition to being CEO, um, it's always cool to hear about the multiple roles and the multiple different projects you're able to touch um, being a physician in industry. The, I think we'll go next to um, 
a question that uh, that one of uh, one of the participants has um, added of how have attitudes toward medical professionals entering industry change during your careers? Um, and you know, I, I guess to add on to that, what are misconceptions or myths about physician careers in biotech and pharma, and how would you dispel them? You know, I'll get started here. I, I would encourage um, everybody to read uh, Michael Eller's brilliant piece on this that just published in Cell Press in the last week, or at least in the last week I became aware of it. Um, he's had an extraordinary career, Pfizer, Biogen, now a venture capitalist with Apple Tree. And um, just it was a it just perfectly captured some of the misperceptions around the academia and industry. Um, um, perceived challenge. Um, the truth is that it's a two-way street, um, but that traffic is moving more heavily in one direction than the other. There aren't a lot of people that re-engage into academia after being in industry. And um, I'm not a sociologist, so I don't know why that is. But I can say that many people do find it possible to go there and back again. And I think that's changing. People used to call it selling out. Well, there's a lot of money to be made in academia as an entrepreneur. I'm not sure that that's necessarily true that every biotech company goes supernova. Um, I think that people right now who have come up as physician scientists don't have as great an activation energy barrier to traverse to learn about biotech. Look at events like this. We didn't have anything like that. To get introduced to people in biotech, um, they probably know somebody who's made that transition um, and, um, uh, and the sector is very welcoming, very welcoming. It's a chance to, um, translate ideas, work as a team and be a part of a real, of a real impact. Um, so I hope that a lot of the misconceptions have now been, um, shaken down. I think that this idea of selling out is ridiculous. I think this idea that it's a one-way street is ridiculous. I think the idea that you couldn't hack it in academia and you went into industry is ridiculous. And people that should go into industry should know that you only get to be Shanaz and Akshay as if you really crush it in industry, the way that academic advancement works too. It's not an easy life. Um, um, but I do think it's quite bi-directional these days. Yeah, absolutely. Akshay, Sanaz, anything to add in terms of your perspective on how things have changed? Um, you know, I think uh, I agree with what Jay said. They used to call it, you've gone to the dark side of an eye transition in 98. Um, and that perception has changed. I think um, some things that are still there and we need to work on, you know, include the idea and I, I, I sometimes get a hint of this when I speak with academic colleagues, you're working on a target or a program and you have some experts with you, uh, other physician scientists from say teaching centers and you get a sense sometimes that they think we're just doing this for the money or that um, you know, you're a company and you don't really care about this disease you know, the way we do, we're the treaters. You know? and, I, I think um, a lot of academics have very good mutual respect or we have mutual respect with them for the work we do. But sometimes you get that. And I think we need to, as a field, continue to work on that. Um, because I, in my experience, I've been very proud to be associated with all the colleagues and companies where I've worked where, you know, by and large, most of the time, people are doing it for all the right reasons and doing things in a way that are as best as they can and, and making difficult decisions oftentimes about shutting down programs that are just not helping a patient or there may be adverse events or um, you know pushing something along and pushing the team because we can get a treatment to patients earlier and so I think um, there are two aspects that are not well understood that you know oftentimes by and large the purity of what we try and do as physicians and physician physician scientists with our colleagues in industry is, is I'm quite proud of it, actually, uh, very proud of it. And the second is that I can stand behind every data point I've generated in my career, every single data point. If you want to reproduce it or you want to trace how I got that data point, I can show you. And I'm very proud of that. And as we know, in academic research, you know, there's a lot of um, confusion about certain results. And, and, and nowadays we talk about retractions and things in academic literature. 
Um, and one thing by and large in industry, because of the quality of the research that we do, that we can be proud of, and we need to help people understand about is just how verifiable, reproducible, incredible it is by and large. Yeah, yeah I can just add that um, the ecosystem has definitely expanded. You know, um, there are more academics now spinning up companies and, uh, you know, I don't know, Bob Langham must be on to like yeah. double digits at this point. Um, you know, but, um, you know, the, the point is that the infrastructure now exists to do that fairly seamlessly, uh, both from the point of view of tech transfer offices that enable this, plenty of venture financing to do, you know, seed or series A fin financing, um, a lot of academics or thought leaders being involved as venture partners or EIRs with, you know, that especially, I think I feel it mostly in Boston, but also in the West Coast, there is a pretty good, you know, cross-functional ecosystem now that has developed to make starting a company not such an onerous thing. So, so that's that part. The other part I'd say is, all kinds of people are starting companies. Like five years ago, if you asked me who the other female CEOs in biotech were, I could maybe count 10, okay? Um, a few months ago, I was at a biotech CEO sisterhood retreat. There were 250 of us, you know, and all colors, all shades, all, I, so, you know, I think this has become a little bit of a meritocracy in terms of like, if you want to do this job and, uh, and or, or, or make the transition to industry, it, it's perfectly okay to do it. And there's there's enough of a supportive environment which now exists to do that, which I think maybe there was a high bar before, but now it feels like it's, actually you can find the people that can help support you to enable this transition uh, from the lab to industry, from the lab to being an entrepreneur, you know, different kinds and shades of entrepreneurs. So I think it's it's all it's all becoming a lot more accessible. Yeah, that's definitely something we'd love to hear. Um, I just briefly to transition back to something that uh, Akshay, you mentioned in your response and thinking about uh, issues with like data reproducibility and other sort of ethical issues. I'm curious to, to get your thoughts on ethical considerations that you think might be especially salient uh, for physicians working in biotech who might have some sort of like inherent fears or like thoughts about like ethical compromise and in working in an industry or in, in biotech, if you could give us your, your brief thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think where I've found, and I'm sure Jen and Shanaz will agree with this, where I've been in difficult situations, particularly where patient safety has been concerned, um, the thing to do is just stop and say, you first and foremost, you're still a doctor. And, and, you know, what does, because these are patients in your, they're your patients in this clinical trial that you might be thinking about, and there might be an issue that you're grappling with. And so you have to get grounded and say, first and foremost, I'm a doctor, I have to do what's right for these patients in this study. And so if that means the data point to, you know, taking a pause, which we call a clinical hold in the study, whilst we reevaluate things, that's what you got to do. If it means you have to there are too many adverse events of a certain type that suggest that you have to shut the trial down. That's what you need to do. Um, and conversely, there are also times when you know you have to accelerate things because just of the uh, positive nature of what's in front of you, so you can help more patients more quickly. And what I've found, I've been very fortunate in the companies I've been with and the colleagues I've been with. Um, I imagine the experiences around the table are similar, but um, you know, when I have just stopped and, and talked to colleagues and said, this is what I think is going on. What do you think? Uh, people listen and they really want to do the right thing. And, and by that, I mean, all the people on the business side and the other functions that are non-technical, uh, they, they, they need your advice. They're looking to you as a doctor. And so I've been very happy actually that with some of the most difficult decisions, the support I've received from colleagues, um, you know, within the organizations I've worked in. And so that that that's my account of that side of it. I mean, I'd be interested to hear others, but. Um... Shanaz or Jay, anything else on that before? I think we'll transition to a more open q and I mean, I, I've, I've really, I mean, I don't know that I would characterize it as an ethical dilemma necessarily. I think there are, you know, slightly different points of emphasis, um, you know, and, you know, in industry, you have the opportunity to have, again, 
broad widespread impact and the consequence of decisions have broad widespread impact. So the lens through which you view risk benefit um, is maybe slightly different than if it was, you know, a treatment option for an individual patient. So I think that that there is that, and then, and then it's the consequences of what that means, you know, for the trial, the company, the, et cetera. So I think it's just a different lens through which to view um, decision-making. Absolutely. Um, I think we'll transition to Q&A because we have many uh, great questions. And uh, Shanaz, thank you for typing out so many answers as well, live. Um, we'll try and do some rapid fire, but I'll start here with, um, Jay, uh, can you comment on um, how common and how feasible it is for biomedical research scientists to go back to academia as a PI um, from industry? Um, I think it's not common, but it is possible. Um, in particular, in clinical practice, I just transitioned back to clinical practice. It was pretty seamless. There were a lot of e-trainings um, <laughs> and a couple tests to take oh. and some time with the CPR dummy. Um, the, but those are real barriers amongst others. Um, so, I, uh, But I, th I think that to open an academic laboratory now, um, I, I think it would be a conceptual challenge for me um, to fight so hard for fifty dollars to $75,000 to pick up a technician's salary, you know, having experienced the pace and sophistication of a professional research environment uh, probably reflects poorly on me, but that would be hard for me um, at this point. It's been quite indulgent to think just about science and how to get it done and have commercial colleagues, you know, bringing in um, uh, the incredible resource from that access to our medicines globally um, uh, produces. Now, with that said, um, one of my closest friends, Nathaniel Gray, was an industry chemist, went back to academia, and he's a, having a massive impact as an academic chemist. So um, it's uncommon, but totally possible. Akshay, I'll, thank you. Akshay, I'll go to you next about um, someone is asking, you know, there's a lot of difficulty applying as an international medical graduate to training programs in the U.S. Um, does that hold true in industry as well? Are American versus international graduates seen differently? You know, I'd ask the others to comment as well, but in, in my experience, we have such a shortage of well-trained physicians and physician scientists with the aptitude to work in biopharma that it doesn't matter to us where they come from, you know, so at Allen Island, we'll interview wherever they are. Um, and um, so, you know, with a small startup company, oftentimes they'll be looking locally or within the U.S., but generally as these companies grow, um, the, they will look anywhere because there is a tremendous war for talent, as people say. And, you know, the other thing with the COVID environment is that, of course, we're all much more comfortable doing this and working in this fashion. Um, and that has been a tremendous enabler for bringing talent in from abroad. Or, or you know, sometimes people start abroad and they relocate there or they locate to the US. Um, so I, I think that aspect um, is less and less unusual, um, certainly at Al Nilo and in other companies that I know of. Um, you know, again, in the, in the small Cambridge biotech scene, early stage, not so much, but again, as they grow, then, then they'll attract talent from everywhere. Absolutely. Um, that's good to hear. Shanaz, um, as you saw, I think a few folks asked about residency training um, and then keeping your license active and generally, you know, how far should you go in your clinical training? Um, and would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, probably not the best person to answer that, but I, you know, because I, I actually opted early on not to redo a residency in the U.S. and to make the change when I transitioned to banking. And I don't feel like it's held me back in any way, shape or form, honestly. Um, but then I did sort of enter through business development initially and then transition back to drug development. Um, so I think it, it's possible to do just fine, uh, depending on what what it is you want to do or where you end up, you know, building a core skill set. So I'm, I, di I didn't feel like I lost out or, you know, uh, it annoys me that I can't write scripts. But other than that, uh, you know, I, I would say that I still stay current through reading a lot of publications and, you know, everything you need to do to be effective in role. Um, I'd love to hear what Jay and actually I have to say about that. Yeah. Any other thoughts? 
Yeah, I mean, I'll just chip in and just to give you a, a contrasting thought. Generally speaking, um, someone like Shanaz is always going to contribute wherever she is. I mean, obviously, very bright, well-trained individual, right? If you want to do drug development, I think that it's helpful if you've seen a, a reasonable amount of, of, of medicine. Um, and so, for example, you know, um, you know, I'd done about 10 years of, of internal medicine and rheumatology before I came into the industry, right? And um, we, our first drug at Allen Island that we developed was uh, for a neuropathy, a rare inherited neuropathy. Well, I'd seen patients with neuropathy. So I, I know immediately what that means to the patient, the challenges they face, and I can communicate that to colleagues. And I can start thinking about, well, if we had to have an endpoint for neuropathy, what are going to be the important parameters? Because you, you're familiar with or patients struggle with them, but they want to see change in their lives if they have a severe peripheral neuropathy. Um, you know, when I was at Bayesian, I was working on drugs for psoriasis. Well, obviously, I'd seen patients with psoriasis. So you can envision what severe chronic plant psoriasis is like and the impact it has on people's lives. So, you know, it can be beneficial in a number of ways, both in terms of getting to groups with the project, communicating more effectively with colleagues, with opinion leaders, when you're talking about your program. And then the, there's the drug safety side, which is, you know, if you have, you know, you're doing a trial and some, there's a safety event and someone says, well, you know, the LFTs have gone up, the ALT is this, the AST is that. And then you say, well, have you done the hepatitis a, B and C serologies? Have, done hep a? have you done the CMV? Have you done, you know, have they got hemochromatosis? Have you, you know, all that comes back to you mm -hmm. and, and it, it's helpful. Now, you know, it, as Shana said, it doesn't stop you from contributing in the industry if you haven't had, you know, some some clinical exposure after your initial graduation. But I, I just think it's a, it, it's value add, especially if you're going to do the drug development side. Um, that's my thinking. Absolutely. So it sounds like you know there are roles available for people who have different levels of training and different interests. And um, I think you know for a lot of people, their interests in doing more training and uh, continuing along that path can kind of help dictate what their interests might be in in industry in the future as well. And, and where they and I, and I and I just to interrupt you, I think we're we're very lucky to have Shanaz on this because you know I'm someone like me or Jay we're kind of the typical example but Shana is a good example of all the different things you can do as a physician in this industry and so you know being pure clinical development which is where I kind of grew up in this industry is, is it's one of many different careers it's business development it's corporate strategy um, you know and uh, other other functions drug safety medical affairs that we haven't spoken about where, where, where doctors can contribute so I think we need a whole nother lecture where we lay out all the different <laughs> possibilities in industry. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll direct this next one to Jay. Um, what is something you learned in your time in industry that surprised you and would have been informative to your younger self, whether that's a physician that's interested in going in industry or someone who's staying in academia, what would be good to know? Hmm. Um. I'm not sure that this maps exactly to academia and industry, but it's something that uh, I've learned through the transition. And maybe also as I'm getting older, I recently turned 50 and that milestone has me feeling sometimes, I don't know, a um, little wistful. Um, one of the nice things about a life in science and medicine and the business of science and medicine is that it can really move in chapters. Um, when I was coming up as a physician scientist, I had icons, you know, I don't know, 50 yards downfield from me, like Gary Gilliland and Stu Orkin. And man, wouldn't it be something to lead a lab that reveals so much about um, human biology and have that science matter um, to patients sick with such impossible situations? Um, I hadn't really realized until Novartis came calling that. Um, it could just that there could be these delicious page turning chapters, um, a segue from training to um, primary investigation. Um, after eight years, a segue into drug hunting. And I don't know exactly what the next chapter is, but if it's half as energizing as the first two, it'll really be something. And I, I think I lacked that kind of life and career perspective that is so obvious to so many, but it was elusive for me. Um, 
I wouldn't change a thing about that time in academia and the science we got to do together and the people we had working together. Um, but I do love this chapter concept. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think to sort of bring things to, to a close, there's a question that sort of inspired by something that someone asked, but also it was a question that, that we wanted to ask you all, which is what opportunities to look for as clinical trainees to begin to explore opportunities in, in industry? And I guess more broadly, what advice might you have for whether it's a medical student, resident, fellow, et cetera, who's interested in biotech and is trying to figure out where to start or where to go? And uh, maybe we'll start with Shanaz and just go around the horn. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, typical entry points are things like medical affairs or drug development, as Akshay uh, mentioned, um, because, you know, typically you want physicians in those roles who can talk to other physicians and think about clinical development strategy and plans and understand what the patients are likely to, um, you know, the, the, the end goal. So uh, there's there, but there are also other areas like drug safety and quality and compliance and, you know, uh, many shades of gray <laughs> in each of those roles that I think are interesting. Um, you know, for me, because I went to business school, you know, going into business development was kind of a, a natural starting point with clinical medicine and, and a bit of a business background. So that could be another interesting area. And, um, you know, and I'd say that, uh, you know, you also have to kind of figure out whether you're more entrepreneurial in, in nature and, you know, risk tolerant and want to go to a startup and do something there, which will potentially offer more opportunities for growth and exploration, or whether you want to start in a solid Genentech type environment, you know, which is, um, which can, which in which you can learn a lot, but in a more controlled setting and, and learn, you know, with things like leadership development and all of that is really important. So I think there are plenty of opportunities to do that. And sorry, I think there was a second part to your question as well. Uh, just about general advice that you might offer. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, for, for the women in the audience, and sorry, I didn't mean to just bring in the gender overlay, but you know, thinking about families, when you're gonna have your family and make that transition and travel and all of this stuff is, is a little bit of a consideration as well. And so, you know, it, 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 in some ways, I think industry can be a more enabling and supportive environment uh, for that stage of life, I think. And then I would just add that, again, there are so many informal and formal support groups now available. There's this thing called the Biotech CEO Sisterhood. There's, you know, Women in Bio. There's HBA. There, there are a million different ways that you can find great support if you want to, you know, just give it a go, you know, <laughs> at the, at a C-level, a C-suite level or an, or a smaller company. And so I think those have all been terrific developments uh, and enablements. Absolutely. Uh, Akshay, Jay, anything? Or maybe we'll start with Akshay to see what you have to add there. Yeah, just very quickly. I mean, I think um, many of us um, in, in Biopharma are open to people just cold calling us and saying, hey, I want to drop by and have a conversation about I've met many, many residents and fellows like that over the years. Um, so I do encourage people to, you know, if, if, if the urge sort of seems to be there to, to start exploring and talk to lots of people because you're making a big decision when you transition out of your clinical training or career uh, into, into what we do. And so um, I always like it when people have, have really done their homework and spoken to lots of colleagues. Uh, very, very often nowadays, it's easy to find somebody who, oh, I know her friend went to work at Merck. And then you say, okay, reach out to them. Okay, talk to them. Uh, because uh, if you both train in the same hospital and you have a common story and they can tell you what it's like there, you start relating to. Um, if you go and, um, one thing I commonly do when I, when I meet people is, um, they, what I, I describe my work and it all seems a bit alien. Then I say, let me show you my calendar. And I show them my calendar within reason and the range of meetings I'm in and what we discuss in those meetings and how I divide my time. And that seems to be instructive to people. Um, and, um, you know, the other uh, aspect of cold calling is there are a lot of recruiters now who recruit MDs to the industry. Um, take their calls, go and talk to them, you know, and 
there are, are many of them are, are pretty wise now as to what a good fit is for an MD for these companies. And um, so, you know, take advantage of those opportunities. And then um, finally, I think Shana's touched on this is, is I think if, you, if you're coming into the industry, uh, you should think carefully before going to a small startup where there isn't much infrastructure. You know, that can be scary, it's disorientating, and you're not, probably not going to get as much support and guidance as you would in a Novartis, in a Biogen, in a Merck, Gilead, uh, or an Allen Island nowadays, you know. Um, so, so that's something to think about. What's the right size of company? And then finally, finally, uh, the question, you know, I, I always say to people when we're hiring MDs coming out of academia is, you know, what makes you happy? Is, is this the right thing? Because if I take you out of whatever role you're doing now, you're serving patients, and I say this, exactly this verbatim, you're serving patients, you're doing a good job at MGH, Harvard, wherever. If we take you from there and bring you here and you're unhappy, that's bad for everybody. You know, and, and so let's all think carefully about why is this the right thing for you? And I think a lot of that, the person in front of you has to answer what journey are they on and why is this the right fit? And are they running away from something or are they seeing something that they want to run to because it makes sense now for the next chapter, as Jay says. Absolutely, and we'll pass it to Jay. I hope people are hanging on these words. I mean, this advice you just heard is so golden. And um, I'll layer, put a couple more layers on it. I, actually, I love your advice about starting in a large and well-resourced environment. Um, thinking about, well, I want to get a Nibber passport stamp and then go into biotech. That's the wrong mentality. You wouldn't need to have like, I want to go to Novartis University. Like I'm a great scientist. I've trained in great places. I have a lot of ideas and skills and experiments I know how to run, but I don't know how to bring those skills together in pursuit of a medicine or the development of a medicine. Um, and um, my, I guess I have two kind of frameworks for guidance here, um, never having thought about it or been asked before. Um, I would think to take something you have real expertise in, a field that you already know that you love and just see it from the other angle. It's so different. You could be a very experienced clinical trialist like Alice Shaw and then come and be the industry sponsor for a clinical trial. And it feels very different with regulatory affairs. As an academic, you write a concept sheet. In industry, you write the whole protocol. You write the whole IND. You sign your name to it. And so if you're interested in clinical trials, think about clinical development, regulatory affairs, medical affairs, as Shanaz suggests. If you're a basic scientist, try target discovery and target validation. Be on the other side of validating the academic science, as Akshay said earlier. If you're a chemist, do med chem. It's not as easy as you think it is compared to natural product chemistry. It's a whole new set of skills or complex biologics manufacturing if you are a biochemist. And where you might be open to this new idea, be highly, highly scrutinizing, especially the group that would assemble on a call like this one. Be scrutinizing about people. Um, do you like those people? Would you go to battle with those people? Culture, how do they describe it? And do other people? feel that the leaders live up to it. The thesis of the company, good biotech companies especially, they stick to their thesis. I bet your Recode five years from now is working on one of the biggest problems of our day, which is getting big things systematically into little cells. Um, the runway, the geography, the strategy, be totally scrutinizing about these dimensions because you won't change those. You'll only experience them. And then shy of taking a full-time role, um, just as a personal reflection, I probably wouldn't have gone to Nibber, exciting as the role was, unless I had already had a really positive experience, you know, working with biotech from the sidelines, advising, consulting, join a scientific advisory board or be a key opinion leader. Um, but, you know, maybe ask to meet at their labs as opposed to them coming to your office or get on a plane and go see Roche and walk the halls and it's demystifying, but it's possibly really energizing. Um, and these are my best guidances. 
Well, I think that's an excellent note to end on. Um, I want to say thank you so much to our panelists for your generosity of time and advice. Um, this is how we inspire and develop kind of the next generation of physician leaders. I personally really enjoyed hearing about how impact driven your work is, how patient focused it is, and people focused as well, and um, how there are opportunities to really develop your leadership and teamwork skills and mentorship as well. Um, and, and enjoyed hearing about the growing diversity diversity in industry from in terms of, you know, kind of training background, uh, gender and racial background as well. So um, this was really inspiring for us, for Shia and myself, and I'm sure I speak for many um, attendees as well. So we just want to say a big thank you for your time. Um, and we really appreciate hearing, uh, hearing your stories and your reflections on, on your experiences. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You as well. Bye.